Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our August webinar series, which is all about setting up a company in China. Over the last two days, we've been looking at the nine key considerations that are needed when establishing a company in China. These decisions need to be made prior to the actual filing of the documentation when setting up your company. Over the last, over the yesterday and the next three days, I'm focusing on four of the most critical decisions that have to be made. And yesterday's was looking at finding out the number around the registered capital that is needed when establishing the company. And that being the working capital that will help to initialize the startup phase of the company in China. Today, we're going to be looking at location. Now, the saying is location, location, location. Location is everything. And the most important thing about choosing your registered office address is that there are both legal and tax consequences on where you decide to set up your company in China. So let's get cracking. Over the first few slides, we are going to be just doing a couple of administration. I know it's August and most people are away on holiday. So I am gonna skip the slide because I know quite a few people that are already participating. But if you are watching, watching this on replay on our YouTube channel, then do write in the comments section, are you a newbie? Are you a startup in China? Are you an experienced China hand? This always gives me insight on who my audience is and it helps me to tailor the types of presentations that I am doing um, uh, for you, for my audience. So please do let me know, are you a newbie? Are you a startup or are you a China experienced hand? How the webinar works. So from a technical standpoint, we are using Zoom meeting. Um, if at any point that I get logged off or kicked off the system, it's probably due to my Wi-Fi. It does take me about a minute to a minute and a half for me to reboot. So please be patient. I will be coming on to finish today's presentation. If you run into any technical issues, just know I can't do anything from my side as I am presenting today but you have the ability to just log off, log back into the system, do that several times. And if it's still not working, just know that we are recording today's session and it will be up on our YouTube channel. And apologies up front for any inconveniences. Um, there are not too many people on today, but again, if you are watching this on replay and you do have questions regarding the webinar, do insert them into the question section or the comment section and we will be approaching you with those questions or contacting me directly. Um, my contact details will be provided at the end of today's um, presentation. So you can just for fast forward to that and get my details and, uh, and you can set up an appointment or just email me directly um, if you've got any questions or any comments. The China expert for the week, unfortunately there'll be no guest speakers. It will just be myself. My name is Christina Kola Kuluchi. I'm head of business advisory at Woodburn and Politics and Advisors. For those of you who don't know me, I am a leading expert in China on inbound investment. That just means that 100% of my clients are foreign investors that are looking to enter and operate in the Hong Kong and Chinese market. I have officially since this month now 17 years of experience in the Hong Kong and Chinese um, jurisdictions, uh, working solely in the profession of corporate services and corporate compliance. I've helped over 500 companies with their international expansion into Asia, specifically into China and Hong Kong. We advise clients on their pre-investment um, stage, everything from what type of business models exist, what would be the right strategy for them, creating a type of phased approach to the market, then helping with the actual implementation of the business models that are chosen that would be applicable to these types of companies, and then the beauty of my profession and something that I really enjoy doing as well as my team is really helping these companies scale up and grow as quickly as possible. The beauty about China is that there are a lot of methodologies um, surrounding uh, the government now and processes have been able, processes have been, have been actually implemented by the Chinese government allowing things to become more clear and transparent. In July, I did a webinar series on all of the different methodologies that exist. So if you're interested in looking at those, those are already up on our YouTube channel um, and you can review them. And just very briefly, I launched a book in 2020 called The Nine Superpowers to Succeed in China. The book is really a book on the princip nine principles of doing business in China. When we go into the Chinese market, particularly for those of you that are at the market entry stage, 
um, you, you've got a huge to-do list, right? And there are certain administrative aspects that tend to be placed at the bottom of that list, but that are so critical to the foundation of the organization you're looking to establish. And the purpose of the book was really to give you all a checklist, a to-do list, an action list of really the most important administrative measures that have to take place in order to protect yourself as an entrepreneur, protect yourself as a leader, a manager, protect the company, the headquarter, from any disasters and obstacles that could arise along the China journey. If you're interested in reading the book, uh, both the Kindle and hard copy version are available on all of the Amazon um, sites. So please do feel free um, to, to take a look at that. So to start today's presentation, we are looking at part three, day three, where we are looking in depth at your registered office address. So one of the key milestones when incorporating or when making your decisions for the incorporation of your company is on location. And registered office address for me is critical because again, when people are looking, when companies are looking to set up their subsidiaries in China, they're always in a rush. And they're not always thinking about what might be the consequences of choosing a city, choosing a district in that city, choosing an office location. And many instances they think, oh, it's easy. We can just amend, adapt, change. You can't. There are very strict uh, legal and tax guidelines that have to be followed based on your registered office address. This is why it's something that is one of the biggest mistakes. It's something I place a lot of emphasis on, which is why I've also included it as my top four um, critical decisions that have to be made. So let's get cracking. All right. So what we're covering today is the importance of a real estate agent, the importance of doing a location analysis. We're going to look at the legal and tax consequences of your registered office address and then action. All right. So let's get cracking on today's presentation. So when setting up a company in China, the first thing that you need to realize is you need a lease agreement for a registered office address. Okay. Now the question is, is what type of office do you need? Okay. And one of the legal consequences I'll be touching on is the fact that virtual offices are illegal in China. Okay. So um, one thing we always recommend is partner with a real estate agent in China who can give you options, right? First, they can give you guidance on where you might wanna be and maybe even offer you a location study to see what would be the best location for you. And then break that down into the actual districts and then commercial buildings or industrial zones that might be available um, for you uh, to register your company. Now, when choosing a location, there are a lot of decisions you have to think about, which is why people wanna take a shortcut when they're establishing their company because they think, oh, we'll just choose a location and change it later. No, we don't do that. You have to make the proper decision ahead of time. Otherwise, you'll be spending more money and ultimately halting your business if you've got it wrong. Okay. So there are 10 key things you have to think about. And any real estate agent will share this with you. One is what is the style of your operation? Um, meaning, do you want to be in a kind of artsy neighborhood? Do you want to be in a grade A top level commercial building? Are you okay with being in a more rundown um, warehouse style building? You know, it all comes down to what is your style of operation? Where, what type of image do you wanna create around your company? The next is the demographics around where you wanna be located. So, you know, Shanghai, for example, is enormous. Um, if you are going to locate your company out in the industrial zones, you know, you're, you might not always find the most highly qualified individuals. So it could be that you have a downtown office where the salespeople are located because they won't travel out to that office. You know, you'll find all of these different reasons why it might be difficult to find the candidates that you need for your, for your business. The next is foot traffic. So, you know, what, how busy is the area around? Is it accessible? Is there parking? Is there um, metro? Are there bus stops? Is it, and this is not just for employees, it is also for customers. If you've got a showroom and you want them to come to you, is it accessible? Is it easy to get to? 
The next is understanding your competition. So where is your competition located, if at all? So if you choose a city, let's say Shanghai, most likely you will have competitors in that city that have branch offices or are actually registered there. Where are they based? Do you want to be near them? Do you want to be far away from them? What is your goal in terms of competition? What is the proximity to other businesses and services? Do you need to have access to third parties and do you need to be close to those third parties? Um, proximity to other businesses and services also means are there restaurants in the neighborhood? Are there other forms of amenities that can be offered? What is the image and history of the site? And I'll touch on that a little bit later. But you know, one thing is looking at the quality of the building, but also if, if there is an image and history surrounding that building, will that elevate the reputation of your company? What are the regulations in that district and in that building, which is important, or in that industrial zone? What is the building's infrastructure looking like? And obviously, what are the utilities, management fees, and other types of costs associated with being located there? So this is just kind of a guideline or checklist for you to think about when you're, when you're trying to find a location, what to think about. Um, and again, this is why I say it's one of your key decisions because you can't make these decisions overnight. And obviously with COVID and borders being shut, you know, it's not like you can visit things physically, but there are ways of getting around this. And this is why it's important to partner up with a real estate agent because they are offering solutions by the fact that people can't easily go to China and do these types of site, site searches, okay? Um, one thing that people don't realize that real estate agents offer is location analysis. So you might say to me, or I had a conversation yesterday actually about this. So I was talking to a company who basically said, yeah, we have people already on the ground in Wuhan, but you know, I feel more comfortable establishing in Shanghai. And I sort of said, well, if you've got people on the ground in Wuhan, why would you want to establish your Shanghai company, then a branch in Wuhan? You're making the whole structure a lot more complex uh, to maintain, to operate, et cetera. So one thing that I just want to highlight that real estate agents offer is location analyses. If you don't know where to locate your business, and for example, you're saying, my three top choices are Guangzhou, Beijing, Shanghai. I mean, there's tremendous differences between all these tier one cities. Um, do a location analysis and use that to discover, assess, and specify what you're actually looking for. The real estate agents will do an in-depth study on your industry in that location, what amenities are available for you, um, but obviously, you have to also give guidelines to them about what you're expecting, what you're looking for, et cetera. But the location studies and the location analyses are fundamental. It's part of the market research, guys. It's part of the data that you need to compile to know where is the best location for you to be in. And yes, you're going to spend money on this research, but it's a one-off fee that will tell you where is the right location to be in China. Okay? And don't do this... Once your company is incorporated, it's too late. You're gonna be spending so much money fixing things. Then if you do this ahead of time in the pre-investment stage where you know exactly then where you should be. Now, I just wanna highlight because one of the things that I was talking about earlier was the image, history of a building, et cetera. And Starbucks did a fantastic thing in Shanghai where they set up their flagship store in this whole historic opera house basically, that's been fully converted into um, a Starbucks. It's, if anybody goes to Shanghai or has already been in Shanghai, you'll, you'll, you would have seen it. It's, it's on um, uh, Nanjing Wu and Nanjing Shibu, and it's beautiful. And it is always crowded with people. Everybody wants to go to the Starbucks. They've got the roastery inside, um, it, it's just beautifully, beautifully done. And they have a second floor for seating as well. Uh, absolutely gorgeous. And it has just boosted the image of Starbucks and the fact that people want to go see the building. And the beauty of it is it, you can have a coffee in that building and admire it. Um, and it was such a tactical strategy to be located there. So if you're in retail, or you're trying to create an image around your organization, 
think about what Starbucks has done. And granted, they will have the funding to be able to do all of this, but you don't have to do it at the scale of Starbucks. You could do something smaller, unique, um, that can really elevate what you're trying to do in the Chinese market. And there was a lot of thought that went into this. Researching the right location, like I said, it is important to partner with a local market entry advisor to understand what are the legal and tax consequences that are surrounding the fact that you're choosing a location in China, okay? And again, nobody takes the time to understand these legal and tax consequences. The amount of clients where they have worked with law firms or other types of service providers and agents where the lawyers have just picked and chosen stuff um, out of a hat uh, to register companies, which then just causes things to be delayed because they have to do a change of register office address later on, is silly. All of these things should be done ahead of time. So let me explain to you in depth what the legal and tax consequences are when choosing your registered office address. So first of all, a registered office address is a must. Everybody must have one. Um, and it is needed for any type of company registration, whether representative office, limited liability company, joint venture, et cetera. And it must be your operational office. So I don't want people to think that they are choosing an office location, registering the company there, and then having a separate office where that's where the people are going to be located. That's where the people are going to be sitting. Don't make things complex. You know why? Because you'll forget that you ever had this office. You'll forget that you never signed a lease. You'll forget that there was never any payments made. This office where you've got people sitting will never be registered anywhere and what will the outcome be? Well, in one of my client's cases, bank accounts frozen. Because the bank said, we verified your registered office address. There's nobody there. You're not there. Uh, we, we also then check that you have no lease agreement. We're freezing your bank accounts. Nothing was registered from the actual operational office. Things in China are so complex and they're moving at such a fast pace. Simplify what you are creating um, and just make that office that you're using as your registered office address is your operational office. Simplify it, all right? Virtual office addresses are illegal and should be avoided. Now, a lot of law, law firms have the ability now to register companies at their location for an interim period, which I'm sure they mention, but clients forget. And this was the case of my client whose bank accounts then as a result became frozen because he never updated his registered office address to the actual operational office location. In addition to that, you've got to be aware that random government inspections happen. They happen out of the blue and you don't get notified. People just come to your door and expect to be greeted for an hour to go through certain questions they might have. And if you are at the wrong address, well, the government might put you on a certain blacklist. And this may cause you to have a bad reputation in certain areas like the banks in terms of getting credit facilities, credit functions. Um, and you've got to be aware of this. So virtual office addresses are illegal and should be avoided. Business centers have loopholes around this whereby they will actually register a location in their office that, is, that has not been registered with the real estate bureau. So you actually do have an office space. You're just not using that office space, okay? But you know you've got a room number, you've got a facility. Um, and again, when you do then choose to either upgrade in that business center to a physical office space, or you decide to locate somewhere else, do that change. Make that effort to remain in compliance about all of your administrative matters. Otherwise, situations like this happen where bank accounts get frozen and random government inspections occur and nothing can be done for you. Remember that you do need to sign a one-year lease agreement, okay? Any agreement shorter than this will be denied during the registration process. So for example, you sign a lease agreement because you were in such a rush, but then you didn't get all the documents ready for the incorporation. It's taken about three, six months. Um, and as a consequence at the time of submission, there's only six months left on the lease. The government will come back to you and say, please resign the lease so that it's one year. So when you're signing your lease agreements, don't waste time. Don't also waste that money. Okay, sign that lease agreement with the thought in your mind that as soon as it's signed, you're going to be doing the submission. Otherwise, you're wasting money ultimately in terms of paying the rent. Okay. 
if you are in industrial zones or locations that are being currently constructed, um, which is what we had with a client in Wuxin, um, the promotions bureau of that industrial zone should issue a letter to state that you will be registered there, um, that you're going to be provided a office address for incorporation purposes, purposes only, that there'll be no rental pay because there's no physical space since it's under construction, and it will be chopped and signed by the construction company as well as by the promotions bureau that is developing this, this real estate project, okay? But as long as you have those papers available with CHOPS, you are secure. Okay? You can have no issues with banks or anything like that because you have something on paper protecting yourself. All right. Now, the type of property is of utmost importance as it really does indicate your business scope. Now, as I highlighted on Monday's session, one of the key activities um, or key decisions that have to be made is the type of entity you're establishing together with um, the business activities you're going to be performing in that company. Okay. Now you've got to imagine if you are doing assembly production, why would you be in a retail shop? If you're doing production and assembly, why would you be in a commercial space? Right. Things have to match up to make sense. So if you're saying that your activities are retail, well, then you need to sign a retail lease agreement okay, where in the ownership certificate, there is a, um, a section within that certificate, which basically sets what type of property is this, whether it's residential, retail, commercial, industrial, it has to match the business activities you're performing. So don't choose a type of property that does not match the activities you're going to be doing. Okay. If you're not doing production and assembly today, then don't add it in your business scope. Add it later on as you're expanding yourself, okay? Um, I was gonna say something else and now I've lost track of that in my mind. Oh, one thing that you will notice is I have not put residential anywhere, um, uh, mainly because companies cannot be res uh, registered in residential facilities, okay? So you do have to keep that in mind. One key thing to remember is unlike other jurisdictions, like in Hong Kong, for example, we've got hundreds of companies that are registered at our, our office address. Only one company can be registered in one registered office space in China, okay? A registered office space is a room with four walls, or it can be a workstation desk, depending on the real estate property. Um, and only one company can be registered with the real estate bureau at that location, not more than one, all right? So we need to keep all of this in mind, all right? Um, and make sure that if you are choosing a property space, a tip would be check that the previous tenant has been removed with the, from the real estate bureau so that you can easily register there. Otherwise, the removal of that ten tenant can also take quite a few weeks disrupting the actual incorporation process, okay? But only one company can be registered in one office space. Now, why am I mentioning this is because um, you may be working with suppliers in China that are offering space to you. Or you may be working with other forms of partners that are offering space to you. It is absolutely fine to, uh, that these suppliers are offering space as long as there are two doors with two room numbers indicated where it's two kind of separate offices in one location, uh, two different room numbers basically, um, and that's registered with the real estate bureau, all right? Now, those are the legal consequences. Now let's look at the tax consequences, which has been really looking at the operational aspect of your business, okay? So I want everyone to keep in mind that um, each city in China is made up of districts. When you choose an office space, you're registering your company in that city, but you're registering your tax status within the district of that city. So I've used Shanghai as an example. In Shanghai, you've got uh, eight, no, uh, probably 15, 12 different, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, uh, no, you've got 17 different districts, OK? 
Okay, in the yellow are this is really the the downtown of Shanghai, and then you've got all the other areas around that. Um, and and Pudong New District actually is has has other um, minor districts within it as well. So one thing I want everybody to understand is that you've chosen Shanghai as a location to establish your company, and you are setting it up with the Ministry of Commerce in Shanghai. But then your registered office address is in one of these districts. Each district has its own tax office, and you are registering in the district that you are that you have your registered office address in. Uh, Woodburn, our office is in Huangpu District, um, and our tax office is the Huangpu Tax Office. Okay. Now I want you all to keep this picture in mind because I'm gonna now tell you what are ultimately the tax consequences around this. So first of all, I'm gonna go back, but let's read this. Tax incentives may be offered by the state, local, or district governments, okay? So you've got that in mind. So when we're looking at this map, um, Shanghai as a whole does not offer any form of tax incentives, but you will find that certain districts will offer certain tax incentives depending on the industry or sector that you might be in, okay? Huangpu district might have certain promotions going on and other districts, others. When you are looking at these type of overall tax incentives, I'd like you all to do a tax planning. Without a tax planning, how can you know whether these incentives make sense for you or not? When you do a budget, which we highlighted yesterday, and you look at the tax planning aspect of that, you've got to understand when, when, do you, when do you think you might be profitable? Will it be in one year? Will it be in three years? Will you be developing profit repatriation strategies to minimize, and op minimize your tax liability and optimize your tax structure? What are you actually planning from a tax perspective? together with your head office, the shareholder, and the subsidiary you're establishing. And then evaluate. When, at what point, will you actually be starting to declare taxes? Because tax incentives that are being offered today don't necessarily make sense if the first time you're gonna declare a profits tax um, uh, declaration is in five or six years. We do not know if these incentives will still be valid in five or six years, okay? So tax planning, together with your budget, from what I discussed yesterday, is critical to know whether these tax incentives will ever make sense to you, okay? So this is one thing that I wanna highlight that's critical. That's why a lot of decision-making has to happen. Don't get excited by things if actually you're only gonna be profitable in six, seven years, okay? Now, if there are other forms of incentives like VAT, individual income tax, that could be of interest because that's something you pay monthly based on the transactions that are occurring and the headcount that you have. So that is something I would look at clear, clearly. So the Greater Bay Area is offering incentives on individual income tax. There are other things that are being offered in other districts and other areas as well. But if you're looking just at the profits tax aspect, do tax planning around that. One example that I want to highlight here that I find very useful if you're looking for commercial space, and especially nowadays, companies that are going into China, with the fact that they cannot go into China, they cannot travel into China themselves, is the fact that they're going to start small. One, maybe maximum two, maybe maximum three people, okay? So one thing that I'm promoting, um, just again by the ease, ease of it, is the Australia House, which is um, a building that was developed, uh, the property developer is called Ankin Group, and it, it has been subsidized also by the Australian government. The Australia House is based in Chunning District, uh, which means that you're registering with the Chunning District Tax Bureau. Um, and as it says here, they are offering incentives to newly incorporated companies or companies that are moving into the Chunning district from other districts with certain tax incentives and tax benefits, all right? It means that you still pay your taxes up front, but then you get refunds <clears throat> up to 50, 70% for three different areas, VAT, corporate tax, as well as individual income tax, all right? 
Now, what is important is that obviously you need to gain eligibility to benefit from these tax benefits. There are five listed companies here and trading companies are also benefiting as well, but it's always important to understand prior to choosing this location, whether you would fall under that description, okay? Otherwise, there's no point setting up there, okay? But this is one of the advantages. This one building has negotiated with the Chunning Tax Bureau to get preferential treatment in order to get companies to be located in, within them. And, um, uh, and they're offering these types of incentives, not just for corporate tax, but also for VAT, as well as individual income tax. So it is interesting, right? Other examples in other districts and whatnot is, um, is tax considerations for high new technology enterprises, HTN, HNTEs, where you need to have certain criteria in order to be able to benefit from the corporate income tax rate. So the regular income tax rate is 25%. Currently, there's also a regulation up to the end of 2022, which is stating that if you have a net taxable income of 1 million RMB, you pay 3% profit tax. If it's between one and 3%, it's 10%. And then if you have over 3 million RMB of net taxable income, um, you're gonna pay 25%. If you can fulfill certain criteria, as an H HNTE, you can reduce that from 25% to 15%, okay? But the core IP needs to be owned by the high new technology enterprise, not by the foreign party, your foreign shareholder. Um, there needs to be at least 30% of the employees having a certain level of diploma or higher degree. And research and development expense is reduced from 6% to 5% of annual revenue, okay? So usually it's geared more towards um, large organizations, but it's still something to think about. Companies that would benefit or that fulfill the criteria under the HNTE are cloud computing technology, mobile internet, encryption, e-commerce, and modern logistics, inspection, certification, um, uh, technologies for culture and creative uh, industries, natural disaster alert and emergency solutions. Right, so these are the types of companies that fall under that category. Now, again, I'm going to go back to the map in Shanghai so you can understand what I'm going to say regarding this. So another big tax consequence, probably the, the biggest tax consequence, is if you've chosen Shanghai and you want to move from one district to another district, this is what happens. So now I'm going to go back to that map. So it's easy to compute what I'm trying to say. So let's say um, I'm going to use the bigger districts because it's easier to say. So let's say I am in Fengxian district, which is to the south, it's in blue color, and I'm not happy, can't find new office locations. We are expanding and growing. Um, I have found a fantastic office space now in Pudong, and I want to relocate to Pudong new district, okay? If you do that, it means that you need to do a, a tax closure audit with the Fengxian District Tax Bureau to then reopen with the Pudong New District Tax Bureau. So you are changing tax bureaus. The Fengxian District Tax Bureau will not be happy because they will be losing tax revenue from you. Hence why they do the tax closure audit to make sure there is zero tax liability in all areas, individual income tax, VAT, profits tax, stamp duty, whatever else might be applicable. That process of doing the closure audit can take up to three months, which means as you're doing that closure audit, you have no ability to purchase VAT invoices, issue VAT invoices, because you're going through a tax closure audit. It means you've halted your business. You cannot open with the Pudong New District Tax Bureau until the tax closure audit is completed, which means your business will be halted for a certain period of time. Smooth transitions might be feasible, but expect that period of halt. I was in China think, let's expect the worst, because then you might get surprised, but you have to think about this very clearly. So, Another key consideration when choosing your location is not just the city, 
and doing a no location analysis on that. It's also looking at the district, understanding the reputation of the tax bureau. Do you wanna be associated with that tax bureau? And looking at the long-term vision, will there be commercial space or industrial space available in five, 10 years if we do expand? And this is all work that the real estate agents should be doing for you to understand whether um, this district is the place where you will stay, okay? I know it sounds like you're tied to one location, but when you think about companies that are based in Germany, in the US, you never leave where you're based. You set up a facility, I don't know, in rural Germany, that's where you're gonna be for the next 50, 100 years, for generations. You've gotta have that same concept in China. You can't just pick up and leave, okay? It, it is a serious change to do this change of dis tax districts. Obviously, the Pudong New District will be very happy to get you as a new client because they're going to earn additional tax revenue from you. So that process is simple. It's just the closure process, which is a little bit more difficult. If you are looking also to change cities, so you are not happy with Shanghai and you say over time, oh, you know what? We might want to establish now in Beijing. Well, it's not just a matter of picking up your company and relocating it. Okay, because actually there's two government systems involved. One is from Shanghai and another one is from Beijing. You actually need to either, option A, liquidate the company in Shanghai to open a brand new one in Beijing, which can be tricky because you've got employees. So you might want to open Beijing first, transfer everything, and then liquidate Shanghai. Or from Shanghai, you open up a branch office into Beijing. Okay. Just think very clearly about the structure though. The cost of maintaining it, the headache of operating two structures, if one of them is actually useless to you, all right? So, you know, everything that I've said requires quite a bit of decision-making about where you wanna be in China and then in that city, where do you wanna be within that city, all right? So as an action plan, one of the first decisions I would say is if you are looking to start small, which most people are in today because nobody can travel to China, the scaling up is not going as quickly as people would like because of this block travel blockage. So maybe you want to start off with a business center first, which offers you that flexibility to not think about renovation of an office space, purchase, purchase furniture and, and you know, basically create a home. Home, home aspect, but going into a business uh, business center that's already set up, you've got all the furniture, every, all the infrastructure is already there um, and using that as an interim period. Almost all districts in places like Shanghai, Beijing will have business centers located there. So you have that option available to you versus going directly into an operational office. I just am I'm mentioning this, this is my opinion, purely for the fact that it is very difficult to, be, to travel to China at the moment. The Chinese government has said that the current status quo of travel regulations will remain until June 2022. So if you are looking to get your company established sooner than that, so that by June or July 2022, things can really kick off, I would recommend a business center open the operational office. And to sum up, I mean, basically, location, location, location. Location is critical not just from a foot traffic perspective, but from a, a tax and legal aspect, it is important that you choose the right location for your business. Determine your rental budget. Sometimes in China, and I went through this personally, you go through issues where suddenly overnight your rent gets increased by 50%, and you quickly have to make a decision within 30 working days about moving to somewhere else because uh, you can't afford that increase, but determine your budget, negotiate your contract securely enough that you have control over the increases that are occurring over a certain period so you can budget properly, but understand how much you can spend. Your location will affect your operations. So it will, it will affect talent acquisition, talent retention. It will affect logistics. It will affect sales potentially and it will affect just your general operation. So think about how you're going to physically operate in China. 
you've got staff. Where are they going to be? Do they need an office? Are they going to be working from home? Are they going to be traveling within China? Right. There's no travel restrictions when you travel domestically. Um, there might be a couple if you go to certain cities that might have an increase in COVID cases. But if, you really have to check city by city. In general, the domestic travel is a lot easier than international travel to China and out of China. Um, as mentioned, your location can affect the legal and tax con consequences and considerations. I would never rush to make a decision. Um, and like I said, I would meet with real estate agents, not just one, maybe several. Ask them you know, if they can do a location study. And then obviously talk with corporate service providers or other legal professionals about the legal and tax consequences of choosing that location. Ask them, ask lawyers to review the, the real estate contracts, the rental contracts, right? Make sure you are crossing the T's and dotting the I's that everything is bulletproof when you're choosing your, your location. So I'd love to hear what your takeaways were from today's presentation. As mentioned, um, nobody's mes messaged in yet, um, but if you are watching this on replay again, you know, let me know what was your biggest takeaway from this. Um, and uh, if you do have any questions, please ask them. Nothing has come in yet so far, so I'm going to hang out for a couple of minutes. Um, but here are seven ways that you can work with me. One is in incorporation advisory and then doing the actual incorporation in China. We do competitor business scope benchmarking. Um, we also do appointments for supervisors, finance managers, um, non-executive directors. We do tax advisory and the outsourcing solutions for accounting, tax payroll, and compliance. We are not real estate agents, um, but we're more than happy to refer you to real estate agents that can assist you um, with your expansion into China. So just let us know about that as well. And if you're interested in booking a strategy session with me, or um, if you've got questions you want to ask me, the easiest way is through my email, christina at woodburnglobal.com. Otherwise, you can set up an appointment directly in my diary as well. Still no questions have popped in. So just to highlight, we've got two more sessions this week. Tomorrow, we're going to be looking at how to appoint the right people in the corporate management structure. And on Friday, we're going to look at how to open your corporate bank account and how to operate it. Just highlighting that because the key thing is actually physically operating it and how you might be doing that from abroad with the fact that you might not have somebody that you trust to operate the bank locally on the ground in China. So we'll look at that as well. If any of these are of interest to you, you can subscribe at woodburnglobal.com slash events. Still no questions have popped in, so I'll leave you there. Um, and uh, I wish everybody a great day and I hope to see you in the next webinars. Take care and goodbye.